Hello friends, I'm Jill Morricone and I'm so glad that you have tuned in for our brand new quarter in the Crucible with Christ. It's going to be an insightful and a practical study of Christianity. So I am looking forward to it. To my left is part of my family here, Pastor John Loma King. Glad you're here. Yeah, thank you. It's good to be here. This is a good lesson, not a whole book, but very practical and we're, we thank the Lord for it. We're looking forward to learn some new things. Amen. I am as well. To your left, Ryan Day. Glad you're here. Amen. Always a blessing to be a part of the 3 ABN Sabbath School panel. Amen. To your left, Pastor John Denzi. Delighted you're here as well. It's a blessing for me to be here. I'm looking forward to this lesson as well. Amen. Last but not least, my sister Shelley Quinn, anchor in the other end. Glad you're here. It's such a privilege to do this study. And I have to say, we all get into a crucible every now and then. This is Practical Christianity 101. I love it. It is. Mm -hmm. I am super excited about it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we go any further. Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Gracious Father, loving Lord, we open the Bible and we pray that as we do so, that we will also open our hearts. Mm -hmm. Father, we need your spirit to pour into us. We have studied, but what can we do without the power that you make available? Mm -hmm. So come and speak to us, Lord, that we may speak words intelligently, yeah. spiritually, yeah. so that someone who may even be in a crucible at this moment can mm -hmm. find the peace and comfort that comes only through you. We desire but one thing, and that is to give all the glory to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to start the lesson maybe a little different angle than you would expect. We're going to tell you what the lesson is not, and then what the lesson is. The lesson is not a theodicy. It is not the justification of God in the face of evil. It is not why is God seemingly silent in the face of evil or why do bad things happen to seemingly good people? Why are children abused and neglected, murdered? Why are women raped? Why do families have to see their children die? That's out of the natural order of things. Why is there famine? Why are there car accidents in this world? We will touch a little bit during this quarter on some of those questions. We're going to touch a little bit on the book of Job, that book of books of suffering. Job questions God's fairness by speaking against the injustice of the divinely permitted tragedies that he has to endure. And the bookend of Job, I always think, is the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk also questions God's fairness, but it's different than how Job questions. Habakkuk questions by demanding that God send judgments upon the wicked. But that's not really the focus of this lesson. This lesson is how do we walk through crucibles? How do we endure pain? and suffering and trials that are a result of the world of sin that we live in. Mm -hmm. How do we find Jesus in the midst of pain? You know, if you think about Christ, Christ is our creator, John 1, 3, all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. He's a God of power, a God of strength. He's our creator God. And yet this creator God is also our redeemer. Isaiah 53, he's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Here we see the conundrum, as it were, of the creator God, the om omnipotent, all-powerful God, mm -hmm. who also suffered with humanity and suffered in a way that you or I could never even experience. Because we just experience our own griefs and our own sorrows. But at the cross, he bore all our griefs and our sorrows and our sins. Mm -hmm. The lesson focuses on the suffering of our Savior and the suffering that we see from heroes of faith throughout the Word of God and how we can learn to grow in grace, how we can become more like Jesus, how we can be trained in righteousness, how we can extend comfort to others with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. Because uh, when it all boils down, even if we don't understand, we know that God is love and we know that we can still trust our Heavenly Father. That's right. This week we look at Psalm 23. So turn with me to Psalm 23. Each one of us is going to have a portion of this most beloved Psalm, David's Psalm, the shepherd's crucible. Of course, God is our shepherd and we, we are the sheep. 
Most importantly, this psalm, as we look at it, is studied. Of course, we look at it from the perspective of the shepherd, but also from the perspective of the sheep. Now, I like chiastic structures. I like literary structures. And Psalm 23 is really a chiastic structure. You have A, which is presence. This is verse 1. The shepherd is with me. Then as you move in, you have B, which is provisions. What are the provisions the shepherd gives us? Green pastures, water, restoration. As we come in further, we come into the central point of the psalm, that C. That is paths. There's two paths, the path of righteousness and the path of death right there at the middle. Then we come back out to provision. If you go further in the psalm, verses 4 through 6, we see the provision, the table, the anointing, the oil. And then we come all the way back out to A again at the very end. We come back to presence. We dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our memory text is Psalm 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Sunday's lesson, A Guide for the Journey, we take a look at the shepherd. I just have Psalm 23, verses 1 and 2. You know, the story is told of children in school who were asked to draw a picture of God. And every one of those children in their picture, they had a heart in it. And they said, why did you draw a heart? And the children said, because God is love. But you know, as we become older, we become more cynical. God doesn't change, but we do. Uh, Malachi 3, 6, he says, I'm God. I do not change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yet, as we grow older, we learn that people, they're not always trustworthy. We learn that we can expect good, but yet sometimes bad creeps up behind you. We learn that you can eat right, you can exercise, you can get sleep at night, you can trust in God, and you still might get a disease. Is God still love in the midst of this world that we live in? Absolutely. But Satan seeks to twist our understanding of the character of God. Let's read Psalm 23, verse 1. The first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The symbol of a shepherd is used for God both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Since we have God as our shepherd, we have need for nothing else. Now, I want to give you in my remaining time 11 things that the shepherd does for us. We're going to move very quickly. Number one, we're going to Psalm 28. We were in Psalm 23. Jump over. Psalm 28, verse 9. What does the shepherd do for us? Number one, God, the shepherd, he keeps us together. Psalm 28, 9. Save your people. Bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. He keeps us from scattering as the sheep. He gives us guidance and direction. He keeps us together. Number two, we're still in Psalm, Psalm chapter 80. Jump over to Psalm 80, verse 1. God gives us direction. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. He leads us. He gives us guidance. Number three, we're going to Isaiah. Isaiah 40, verse 11, the first half of that verse. Number three, God grants us provision. He will feed his flock like, what's that word? A shepherd. A shepherd. Mm -hmm. God gives us provision. Number four. <laughs> God deals with us tenderly. We're in the same verse. We're just going to finish it. Verse Isaiah 40, verse 11, the second half of the verse. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. This, of course, is the portrait of the coming Messiah. But we see God as shepherd deals with us tenderly. Number five, we're going to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 23, and we'll get several points out of this. Jeremiah chapter 23, pick it up in verses 1 and 2. Number 5 is God will judge those who hurt you. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people. You have scattered my flock, driven them away and not intended to them. Behold, what is he going to do? I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. So what does that mean? God will judge those who hurt you. Number six, 
God restores us. We're still in Jeremiah 23. Let's read verse 3. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. God is our shepherd restores us. Amen. Number seven, we're reading verse four. We're still in Jeremiah 23, verse four. Number seven, I was set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. So God ensures we are not afraid. And again, he provides for us. Going to number eight, the last of them are from John chapter 10. So turn over to John chapter 10. We're going to pick it up in verse 11. Number eight, God sacrificed himself so that you and I could be saved. John Amen. 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. God sacrificed himself to save us. Number nine, God knows us intimately. John 10, verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. God knows us intimately. Number 10, God brings unity. John 10, verse 16, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. God brings unity. And finally, number 11, God speaks to us. We're in John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Do you want to be led by the good shepherd? Do you want Jesus as your shepherd to lead you? No matter what trial you're going through, no matter what you experience in your life, he is your good shepherd. He is the one who keeps you together. He's the one who gives you direction. He's the one who gives you provision. He's the one who deals with you tenderly and judges other people who hurt you. He's the one who restores you and ensures you are not afraid. He's the one who sacrificed his life mm -hmm. so that you could go free. He's the one who knows you intimately and wants to bring unity into your life. Amen. He's the one who speaks to you. And finally, Psalm 23, verse 2. He makes you lie down in green pastures. He leads you beside the still waters. He gives you rest. Do you want rest? He promises us in Matthew 11, come to me, all you who labor and are weary and heavy laden, and I, I will give you rest. Come to the shepherd of your souls, no matter the crucible that you are experiencing, and he will give you rest. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Wow. How do you fit in 11 points in all that time? It's amazing how you do that. You know, the 23rd Psalm is an amazing, amazing passage. I've often said it is, in fact, in the Bible, the complete summary of the Christian's life. If you can say the Lord is my shepherd, everything that is listed in the 23rd Psalm will be a part of your experience. From the beginning where he found you as a lost sheep, all the way to the point where we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm in Psalm 23, verse 3, which is, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Mm. You know, righteousness is never for our glory. It's always for God's glory. That's why he says, let your light so shine. But I'm going to read the introduction that the writer of the lesson put in it because it was so wonderfully put together. Talking about a journey, just imagine being on a path of righteousness or a path at all, and you just cannot see the end of the journey. Sometimes the mountains block it. Sometimes the crest of the hill uh, uh, obscures the journey from you. Sometimes the turn is so steep, uh, you can't see around it. But you know that at the end of this journey is home. Mm -hmm. More specifically, in the beauty of it, God's home. Mm -hmm. listen, to the way he, listen to the way he says it. He says, Imagine the paths of righteousness stretching out before you, way into the distance. You cannot see the end, but you know that at the end of the journey is home, God's house. As you focus a little closer to you, do you see where the path lead? You can see some clearly, or some places clearly, but other parts are totally obscured by large or dangerous obstacles. Sometimes the path disappears over a ridge. Some part of the path are easy to walk along, others are difficult. It was just like this in Israel's travel from Egypt to the Promised Land, and it is described the same way in this psalm. So it's the journey of the Christian. Yes. Each one of us has those parts in our lives where 
man, we just want to give up in the desert. But I want to bring out the four things because the 23rd Psalm, uh, it talks about the locations. Mine is entitled Locations on the Journey. And my wife and I do this sometimes. We've been in ministry now 35 years. And every now and then we look at the journey where we were when we started, what happened along the way, the part of the journey we wanted to quit. And then we say, I'm so glad we didn't quit. God is faithful from the very beginning to the very end. But the 23rd Psalm, I break this down because there are four takeaways, Jill, that come out of the picture of the 23rd Psalm. Let's look at the 23rd Psalm and I'll break this down as we go. I'll read it one more time. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What kind of paths? Green pastures. Yeah. And when you look at that, this shows the abundance of God. God never leads us to a lack. He always leads us to an abundance mm -hmm. that we might have life and have it more Abundant. abundantly. And so we find the abundance of God is talked about by David, but illustrated all through the New Testament. Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The abundance of God, that path that's always green. Ephesians 3 verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. God is an abundant God. Luke 6 and verse 38. But God's abundance sometimes is also reciprocal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can unlock God's abundance by what we do. Give and it will be given to you. Mm -hmm. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet or use, it will be measured back to you again. So some of us can participate in the abundance that comes our way by being cheerful givers. Not just tithe and offerings, but helping to carry the burdens of our brothers and sisters. What other way does God lead? What, el what other way can we find on the locations that are along the way? Still waters, mm. which talks about the stability of God. First, the abundance of, abundance, abundance of God. Next, the stability of God. Had a time getting that word out. <laughs> Isaiah 41, verse 10. What's God's stability? Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right arm. God is stable all the time. We may change, mm. but how often is God the same? Good. Yesterday, today, and forever. What else does the Bible tell us? Psalm 96, verse 10. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. The stability of God. Then we find in the paths of righteousness, the transformation of God. Mm. We don't go into paths righteous. We go into paths of God and become righteous. Mm. First Peter 2 and verse 9. This is what happens in the path. But you are a chosen generation. Let me rephrase that. But you become a chosen generation. You become a royal priesthood. You become a holy nation. You become his own special people. Why? That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness off the path into his marvelous light, which is all along the way. Now, sometimes the path is obscured in the darkness of our experience, but the path is never dark because God doesn't deal with darkness. In his presence is glorious light. But sometimes in our own experience, I remember knowing someone's, I uh, had an experience with someone who, you know, you could say the nicest thing and this person will always find the crumbs at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> They'll always look at the residue in the glass. <laughs> Something's always wrong. Like you'll say, hey, let's go to the, to the amusement park. They say, well, somebody died last week on the roller coaster. <laughs> hey, let's go to the beach. You know, there's sharks in the ocean. <laughs> They always found the negative side. Hey, let's go for a walk. You know, somebody got hit while he was walking. You know, <laughs> they always find the negative side. But it's not God. Some people have their own personal cloud. Mm -hmm. But when you are with God, which brings us to the fourth part, the valley of shadows of death is also along. And I know we'll bring that out even more as we go on. But in this, we go from the transformation of God to the comfort of God. Psalm 23, verse 4, and I know you'll develop this more. But it says... Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But then I also saw 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, the comfort of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts, comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort 
with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Comfort four times. God comforts us, we can comfort others. That's right. As we experience the comfort of God, only then can we say to someone in tribulation, the Lord will comfort you. But here's the other thing that this points out. You know, the righteous, we don't need to know which way we're going. Mm -hmm. We just need to trust the God who's leading Amen. us. And that's something mm -hmm. that's always, you know, what does God have up his sleeves? Mm -hmm. What is he up to now? Right. What is God doing? Have you ever said that before? I mean, is, is God really the one calling me? Is this really God behind it? Or, mm -hmm. or is it just some deep desire that I'm manifesting because I heard about something that's ahead of me? Right. We don't need to know where we're going. We, sh we just need to trust the one who is leading us. Mm -hmm. Well, you've heard the passage, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Mm -hmm. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall do what? Direct, direct your paths. Why does he direct our paths? When we become righteous mm -hmm. in the path of righteousness, Psalm 37, verse 23 said, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Why? Because he delights in his way. When we are walking in God's way, God delights because we are walking with him in the way he has led us. But the Lord leads in multiple ways. First, the path of God are the right paths because they lead to the right destination the shepherd's home. It may not feel like the right path because we get trials on that path. You know, sometimes in our churches, in our homes, in our families, in the places we work, in the experiences of life, it doesn't always work out. But it's not the path that we should blame. It's just simply the incidents. From Egypt to Canaan, there were serpents and scorpions. Mm. But God was still leading. That's right. Secondly, the path is right because they keep us in harmony with the right person, the shepherd himself. Mm -hmm. Many people may try to distract you, but stay focused on Christ. Yeah. It's his path, and only the shepherd can keep his sheep if we focus on him. Thirdly, they are the right paths because they train us to be the right person mm -hmm. to be like the shepherd. Amen. The shepherd molds us. We become like him, not at the very beginning, but if we endure, we become like him because he's the one doing the molding. And fourthly, it is the right path because it gives us the right witness mm -hmm. as we become the right people. We give glory to God. They are right or righteous paths, whether the, whether the going is easy or difficult. Mm -hmm. And finally, Proverbs 4 and verse 18, the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. Stay on the path. It's just one of the locations before we get to the Lord's house forever. Amen. I love Amen. that. Thank you, Pastor John. I want to be on the path of the just. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Amen. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study on the Shepherd's Crucible, Psalm 23. And we're going to kick it over to Ryan on Tuesday. Amen. I'm Ryan Day and I have uh, Tuesday's lesson which is entitled Unexpected Detour 1, The Valley. Mm -hmm. I think Pastor Denzi has this unexpected detour too. So, right. you know, it's amazing because along our journey, along our path as we are following Christ, uh, sometimes we, you know, we can end up in places, and we're going to talk about this in, in this lesson. Sometimes we can end up in places that we might not thought we would ever uh, be. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this case, we're talking about the valley. Pastor touched a little bit on verse four there. We're going to read verse four, and then we're going to just kind of break it apart and highlight some of the high points here. But Psalm chapter 23, verse four, uh, <laughs> we've heard these words a lot, especially when someone is, is dealing with some type of tribulation or trial or sorrow or difficulty or challenge in their life. They'll often quote this text, mm -hmm. yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Uh, you know, I've, I've thought of David. David is the one who wrote this. And this brother, 
this brother went through some valleys of shadows in his life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't probably, other than Job and maybe a couple of others, you could say this brother, in fact, he practically lived there his entire life. I mean, more than three-fourths of his life was spent in war and in battle and combat trying to fend off the enemies of, uh, you know, that wanted to destroy him and the children of Israel. I mean, this brother spent a lot of time in trial and tribulation and, and in the valley of the shadow of death, but yet he learned to depend on his shepherd. Mm -hmm. And uh, the lesson brings this out, you know, just a short ways in. It asks a question, and this really resonated with me because as I was pouring through this lesson and just, you know, trying to determine how I was going to approach this lesson, wow, it really hit close home to me. Because here was the question it asked. Think about the times you have been in your valley of the shadow of death. Mm -hmm. What has it been like? Did you have fear or even though, even though you knew that the shepherd was there? And then it asked, which Bible verses were the most precious to you at the time and why? You know, I have had moments in my life where I felt like I've, you know, been walking through those shadows, you know, the valley of the shadows. But I can tell you probably the most difficult time in my life where I walked through literally or I experienced a literal valley of the shadow of death was when I watched my mother literally approach uh, her end in that valley of the shadow of death. Uh, three years ago, my mother passed and... Um, you know, I know we all have had loved ones and friends and family over the years. It just seems like it's a part of, it's a normal part of this life. Mm -hmm. People die. We lose friends and family and it's, it's horrible. But, uh, you know, God blessed my family in the sense that he allowed me almost to the age of 30 to not experience any type of death in my immediate family. And so my mother and I and our family, we were very, very, very close. And when I watched my mother struggle for 53 mm -hmm. days in a hospital fighting for her life, uh, it was hard. Yeah. And it's interesting because I remember on the first day that she went in as she was preparing for this emergency surgery that she was about to have to go through, she looked up with teary eyes and she said to me, she said, son, she said, pray for me. Uh, she said, I, I don't know if I'm coming out of this one. And we were all like, mom, come on, stop with that negative talk. You know, hey, you know you, you're going you're to come through this. You're going to come through this. And, but it's almost like she knew. She knew something. And we watched her struggle for 53 days in the hospital. And, and, uh, but something miraculous happened in that valley of the shadow of death. My mom, who had drifted very, very far away from God, it took her going through that valley mm -hmm. for God to bring her back to Him. Mm -hmm. It was in the darkest period of her life uh, that God was able to draw her back to Him. I watched my mom's life convert. I watched her, her character change. She became a completely different person, mm -hmm. someone who was uninterested in spiritual things, uninterested in the Bible, uninterested in, in church, uninterested in these things. But becomes so devoted, praising God from her bed in the hospital and singing. And, 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 and it just, it was amazing to see that through this valley of the shadow of death, God was allowing my mother and us as a family to go through this, to watch my mom suffer uh, to the point that it was, it was difficult. It was, it was a trying time to the point that I remember the day that she died. Uh, I, I honestly thought God was going to pull her out of this because I'd seen a change and we had made plans for her to come and stay here in my house and, 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 and and come and learn and grow at Thompsonville Church. And it was just, it was an awesome thing, but yet God took her. And I remember calling out to God and saying, Lord, why, why, why? But I remember God used J.D. and Shelly Quinn at that time to really minister to my heart. And uh, speaking of the verses uh, that really helped me uh, catch a glimpse because I remember asking, Lord, I had thousands of people praying for my mother. Do you not hear your people's prayers? Could you not have saved her life, Lord, to allow her to continue on? And But God knows best. God had a plan. God was going through that valley of the shadow of death with her and he had a plan. He, he could see things that we couldn't see. And I remember a verse that was shared with me that I'd read many times but never really considered its impact until then was Isaiah 57 verse 1. Mm. The righteous perishes and no man takes it to heart. Merciful men are taken away while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. You know, I don't know that that's the case, but I have a hope saying, Lord, I don't know why you didn't answer my mother's prayer, but I saw my mom change. And for whatever reason, you decided to take her life. Perhaps he saw something ahead in her path down the road beyond that valley of the shadow of death that might have drawn her away. Maybe the enemy could have drawn her away. He can see things.
things that we can't. The shepherd can see things often in our path down the road that we can't see. And That's even right. though we might have to often walk through that valley of the shadow of death and we're looking up and we're saying, God, why? Why is this happening to me? There's a reason why oftentimes we fall into that path. Uh, just a couple of other verses that really comforted me during that time. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, which uh, Jill read earlier, but Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our shepherd would comfort us. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Your shepherd will bring comfort if you would allow him. Do you trust in him? Then the, then the, then the, 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 the lesson asks this question. How do you think the shepherd ended up, in, how do you think the sheep ended up in the valley? Do you think the sheep went there on their own or did the shepherd lead the sheep the way himself? I think there's a, 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 a double application here in the sense that I think oftentimes we can find ourselves in that valley of the shadow of death because we put ourselves there. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So sometimes we can often find ourselves in that valley because we put ourselves there. But you know, sometimes the Lord is there to also lead us through that valley when it's appropriate and when he sees something that needs to be done in our character and in our lives. I think of um, Jeremiah 29 and 11, you know, 11 verses 14, 11 through 14 there, that famous passage where God says, I have a plan for you, you know, and, and, but yet in verse 14, he says, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from the nations, from all the places where I have driven you. God had to drive the children of Israel to a place that wasn't his original plan for them to go, but because of their iniquities because of their rebellion he allowed them and in a sense drove them to captivity to teach them a lesson hopefully to go through this valley of the shadow of death for the purpose of getting their attention and awakening them James chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 what does it say my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing in the latter part of this verse here, Psalm 23, verse 4, it says, I will fear no evil. <laughs> I will fear no evil. The Lord has not given us a spirit of fear. The Bible makes that clear. Sure. But oftentimes we fear, I believe, for two main reasons. Now, it's not limited to these two reasons, but I think for two main reasons many people fear. And that is we are not abiding in Him and need to abide. Oftentimes we know we're not abiding in Christ. We're not abiding in the shepherd. And because we're not abiding, we know we're not abiding. And when we fall into those traps, into those valleys of the shadow of death, sometimes we find ourselves in fear because we know we're not right with God. We just simply need to abide. And of right. course, number two, one of the number, no one, number one reasons why we often, uh, uh, you know, we, we have experienced that fear is that we do not trust him. We don't trust the shepherd. What does Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 say? I think Pastor just read it earlier. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Powerful. Just trust in the right. shepherd. The shepherd will lead. And of course, the next part of the verse there in Psalm 23, verse 4 says, You are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, why the rod and the staff? What is the purpose of the rod and the staff? Or the rod and the staff is one and the same. The rod conveys the conception of authority, power, and discipline. And of course, the staff represents all that is long-suffering and kind, but it's also for the defense fence of the sheep. The enemy wants to destroy and scatter the sheep. So he defends us. Let me tell you something. And, and, and in, in this, I say this in, in, in all sincerity. Crouching tiger, hidden dragon has nothing on your shepherd. All of your famous action heroes that we look to for this redemptive myth of violence that somehow vi Jesus, the Bible says he is your shepherd. He is your protector. He is the God that will, that will defend you and he will protect you. When the enemy comes, trust in your shepherd. Trust in the Lord. And he, with his rod and his staff, he will bring comfort and he will lead and guide his people, if you will allow. Amen. Well, now let's go over here to Psalm 23, verse 5. And we see in Psalm 23, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Now the title for this section is Unexpected Detour 2 the surrounded table. And what is this unexpected detour? Let's take a look at what's happening because Saul, King Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, 
Saul makes an unlawful sacrifice. He did not wait for the prophet Samuel to come and he made an unlawful sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And the prophet Samuel is alarmed and he told him, you should have waited. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, we see Saul making a rash vow because of what was going on in the battle. And he wanted to kill his own son, Jonathan. But Jonathan had done what was right. And Saul, because of his vow, wanted to kill Jonathan. And it was because of the people that he was stopped. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we see King Saul uh, was told that he should slay everyone, including the animals. But he kept the king of the Amalekites alive and some of the animals. Now let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 9. And here's what we have. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good. Mm -hmm. So we see here that he's in a path of disobedience. Mm -hmm. And so this is when the Lord talks to the prophet Samuel, and he tells him in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10 and 11, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried all. He cried out to the Lord all night. Mm. So the prophet Samuel felt this pain because here's the king of Israel going astray. He took a detour from the path of God. But we're talking about a different detour, and that is about King David. Let's go into that in a moment. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 26, because of what Saul has done, here's what, uh, because of the prophet uh, Samuel tells uh, King Saul, And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king of Israel. Mm. So there we see that Paul was rejected from, I mean, Saul the, uh, Saul the king was rejected from being king. And the Lord gave that to someone else. He told them there in 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15 that the kingdom was given to someone else. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, this puts uh, King Saul in who is it? Who is it? And uh, surely enough, he sees David killing the giant Goliath and uh, doing great heroic things and people singing songs about King David. Uh, so we say uh, King Saul has killed his uh, hundreds or his thousands and uh, David has killed his tens of thousands. So Saul begins to get jealous and he allows the devil to lead him in a path of evil. And this is, uh, now I take you to 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 17. And uh, here in the pursuit of David, King Saul... Uh, goes to uh, one of the priests and says, was David here? And yes, he was here and he ate some bread. And uh, he said, you are against the kingdom. So he accuses the priest of hiding his enemy. And uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 17 and 18, this, these are the words we find. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, turn and slay the priest of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he left and did not show it to me. But mm -hmm. the servant of the king would not pour forth their hand to fall upon the priest of the Lord. And King Saul does not take that as an answer. He still wants to do evil. Uh, and he's in 1 Samuel 22, verse 18, it says, And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priest. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest and slew on that day Four score and five persons that did wear a linen infant. Eighty-five priests were killed mm. because of the king Saul just going astray from the path of the Lord, mm. sinking further and further into evil. Now, King Saul becomes the enemy of King David. He had not been king yet, but he had been anointed as king. Now, you ask yourself, you know, he, here's uh, David anointed to be king by the prophet Samuel. And it took somewhere between five and 10 years that he got to the throne. And all through that time, 
David was faithful to the Lord. There were times he was there playing for the king, King Saul. And there was a point in time in which he even threw a javelin, King Saul, to kill David. And David had to flee. Between five and ten years, it's not sure uh, how many years, he was uh, uh, pursued like an animal. And David went from one place to another, living in caves. And there were two times when David had the opportunity to kill Saul, but he was on the path of righteousness, and he said, I am not going to stretch my hand against God's anointed. Now, it is interesting when you see this verse, Psalm 23, verse 5, you, uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Taking a look at that, we see that as Christians, we may have enemies. Uh, did David go around looking for an enemy? No. Uh, as Christians, we shouldn't go around looking for enemies, but people may become our enemies. And so what do we do with that? Do we stretch out our hand against them? We have the example of David that we shouldn't really stretch out our hands uh, against people, in the, especially if they are in a position that should be of respect. And so David... Uh, chose to be faithful to the Lord. As you look at 1 Samuel chapter 15 and uh, the life of, 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 uh, of David, you see that he's asking the Lord, Lord, should I go here? Should I go there? Should I go up against these people? Mm -hmm. And the Lord was answering him. Mm -hmm. So now David is saying, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David is saying that it doesn't matter. You know, you walk into the valley of the shadow of death, you're not going to fear, fear evil because the Lord is with you. And now you even see the Lord providing for you. Right. David was speaking from experience. He saw the Lord providing for him, even in the most difficult of times when enemies are in pursuit of him. God was preparing a table before him. Two things you can uh, see of this and that David was saying, the Lord is taking care of me. He is providing for me. The other thing is that the enemy, because this is in the presence of my enemies, the enemies are seeing, hey, God is providing something for this, this, this guy. He's, he's, right. he's preparing things for him. And that should be a message to them. He's on the side of the Lord. The Lord is providing for him. We better back away. And it's a message of warning that the Lord sometimes blesses his children so that the enemy will see we better leave these people alone because God is with them. And if they continue to pursue evil and try to kill you, try to do you harm, the Lord will visit them with judgment. We have to remember that the Lord says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, the lesson brings this verse out. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Persecute you. This is unnatural for us as human beings. Mm -hmm. What? Love my enemies? <laughs> what? Do good to those that are persecuting me? Wait a minute. No, I'm going to get even. I'm going to get back to them. I'm going to give them. If they give me one, I'm going to give them two. If they punch me once, I'm going to punch them twice. This is the way we are. But as we are surrendering our hearts to the Lord, mm -hmm. our response will be transformed into the response that Christ will give. And it is only by the grace of God that we can love our enemies. Mm -hmm. We can, by the grace of God, bless those who curse us and do good to those who hate us. So we should, uh, by God's grace, surrender daily to the Lord. And as Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. Mm -hmm. And as we take up our cross daily and follow him, we will be able to do good to those who do evil to us. And this is, again, a message for them that they should repent. It may be that they will repent. Remember, God has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Psalms 110 verse 10. And it is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithful, faithfulness. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 22 and 23. And notice that even while we are enemies, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God commended his love toward mm -hmm. us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So yes, the Lord will take care of us, even though we have enemies. He will do good for us in the presence of our enemies. Amen, amen and amen. amen. Thank you all for such a wonderful lesson. And you know, I was thinking, here we've got David. He's just a young lad when he was first anointed, in front of his family anyway, as 
to be the king, the next king of Israel. And he's out. He's the youngest of Jesse's sons. He's out tending to the sheep. He's anointed teenager. He was 30 years old when he became king. Mm -hmm. So there was this time that he spent fleeing in the desert, mm -hmm. running from, from Saul. And let me just ask you, what would your feelings be if you were in the desert surrounded by your enemies who are trying to kill you? I wonder, would we be tempted to feel like God had abandoned us and we're all alone? Or maybe would we feel that God's not doing much or that if he was really working for us, we wouldn't be in that situation at all. Right. That's quite possible that we get, we get trapped and we feel like, Lord, where are you? But this is not David's feelings. He was certain of two things. I have Psalm 23, verse 6. And by the way, my name is Shelley Quinn. It, we're so glad you're here with us today. So I have Psalm 23, verse 6. And here's what David says. Surely goodness and mercy. And this word mercy is hesed, mm -hmm. my favorite Hebrew word. Yes. Surely goodness and mercy, hesed, shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ever. So what is David describing about God's covenant commitment? You know, in the New Testament, you probably, if you have been a Christian for any time, you've heard the word grace. You've heard th that that's God's undeserved favor. You've heard the word agape, which mm -hmm. is unconditional love. Those are both Greek words and we find them in the New Testament. But there's a word that far surpasses those in the Old Testament. And that is God's covenant commitment to us is, to, is the word, the Hebrew word is hased. And mm -hmm. let me tell you something. Right. You cannot translate hased by one English word. Hased is a covenant term that includes all of the positive attributes of God, His love, His covenant faithfulness, His mercy, His grace, His kindness, His loyalty, His devotion, and it's way beyond what we would think is His duty. See, people tell me, oh, you don't find grace in the Old Testament. <laughs> oh, you find it right. dead. That's right. It is yeah. so beautiful. So here's what David says. Surely goodness and mercy has said shall follow me all the days of my life. You know that word follow. I love it in the Hebrew. And it, it most often the Hebrew word that is translated follow here. It is most often translated pursuit. So do, what picture do you get in your mind if it, David is saying, oh, God has said is pursuing me. Can you imagine the goodness and has said the love of God pursuing you? Our loving heavenly father will not forsake us. Amen. He does not change. He pursues us to this day. I'll tell you what, I can testify to God who pursued me with his love Amen. for many years. And he, I, I turned my back on him. He pursued me with his love. He chased me down. And you know what? He's still pursuing me with his love today. So in spite of all of his trials, David knew about God's covenant commitment of his sin that it would continue to pursue it. So let's look at it one more time. Same verse, I'm just repeating it. Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy, has said, shall follow me or pursue me all the days of my life mm. and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Did you know divine love, God's divine love, his purpose of covenant 
is to dwell with us. Mm -hmm. God wants to dwell with us and he wants to have an intimate relationship with us. David knew this. He knew that even though he's running and he's hiding out in the desert, he would he had continual ongoing opportunities for intimate fellowship with a God of covenant love. He knew for certain that God was going to guide him and protect him throughout his life and that he would bring him back to his house to live forever. And you know something? We can know the same today. In Ephesians 1, 4, Paul writes and he says, he, God, chose us in him, in Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, I want to say this. Some people believe the election of God means, okay, some were created to be saved, some were created to be lost. I don't believe that that can jive with free will. I don't believe that that If we really have a study on that, I don't believe that. See, before the foundation of the world, here's the everlasting gospel. The Lamb of God was planned to be slain before the foundation of the world. And God's purpose was that all who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior would be saved And not only saved, but adopted as sons. Let's continue on. In 1 Timothy 2, 4, God our Savior, the Bible says that He desires that all humanity would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. So if you accept Jesus Christ, you are predestined to be adopted as God's son. Ephesians 1, 5 says, He predestined us to adoption as Mm -hmm. sons, as Mm -hmm. children of God, by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So we accept Christ as Savior. He gives us the Holy Spirit. We are born again, born anew into the family of God. He adopts us. And you know what? He, when we are spiritually born again, we've got his spiritual DNA. And then he begins to conform us to the image of Jesus. Now I've just got to skip down toward the end of my notes. It wasn't just David who went through these crucibles. Let's look at Hebrews 11, mm. 13 through 16. Hebrews 11 said, it's talking about all these patriarchs, all of the people and the Christians. It says these all died in faith, mm-hmm. not having received the promise. Right. Mm-hmm. They, were, they were following the promise of God, looking for the country that was not here on earth. It says it did not receive the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. They embraced them. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek mm. a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they'd come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better That is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And he has prepared a city from them. So here's a quote from the quarterly. No matter how deep the valley or how persistent the enemies, the certainty of God's goodness and unfailing love and the certainty of his guidance to the very end of our journey is unquestionable. Amen. A personal note. I've been in a crucible since December of 2019. I live in chronic pain and it's a pretty severe pain and it's several areas of my body. But here's what I want to tell you. I praise God every day because I know that Jesus, the same thought that sustained David, sustained Jesus on the cross and God sustains me day by day, drawing me closer to him. 
in this crucible. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much, <laughs> Shelley, Pastor Johnny, Pastor Ryan, and Pastor John for sharing and sharing from your experience because we all go through crucibles. And yet, look at what God is doing in the midst Amen. of each one of them. Praise His name. I want to give each one of you a moment to share a closing thought. Let's start with Pastor. You know, I look at the story. Uh, we often think that God overwhelms us, but you know, God does not lead us in paths that overwhelm us. His love overwhelms us so that He may lead us into paths. Isaiah 26, 7, the way of the just is upright, almost upright. You weigh the path of the just. It'll never overwhelm us when God is leading us. Amen. Amen. Trust in the shepherd's plan. Jeremiah 29, verse 11 and onward, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Search for him, trust in the shepherd, and he will see you through. Mm. Amen. If you have enemies, allow the Lord to prepare a table before you. And it says here, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. This is an indication of God comforting and God providing till you run over. Allow the Lord to do this for you. Now this uh, idea of uh, anointing includes favor from God and divine favor. Allow the Lord, the, the Lord to do this for you in the presence of your enemies. Mm -hmm. No matter what crucible you are in, just like David, remember that God's mercy, His goodness, His loving kindness, His ascent, His grace, His agape love, He is pursuing you and He will get you through to the other end of the trial, going through that fire trial. You'll come out not smelling like smoke. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all so much. I'm just reminded that He is our Good Shepherd. What an incredible promise we have to hold on to that the Shepherd gave His life for the sheep. The Shepherd wants you in the kingdom. He wants to save you. He wants to transform the crucible that you are in the midst of and bring you out on the other side. Join us next week. Next week is lesson number two, The Crucibles That Come. And I love the titles and I'm going to read them. Crucibles of Satan, Crucibles of Sin, Crucibles of Purification, and Crucibles of Maturity. It's going to be an amazing study. Join us next week.